Hello, thank you, Terry. And thank you all for joining me. Uh, it's a great day to go to the Seychelles, that's for sure. I know most of us that are viewing are uh, in the Chicago area and uh, you're going to have a real nice, warm, sunshiny treat where we're heading. Um, it, uh, the Seychelles are uh, very idyllic, uh, sparsely inhabited and very uh, rarely visited islands. They're just about a thousand miles, at least a thousand miles from everywhere. Officially, they're called the Republic of the Seychelles and they are a cluster of 115 islands in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the country lies actually due east of mainland East Africa. Um, if you've heard of the Seychelles, uh, and you might have, it's because it's become kind of the honeymoon destination for the very wealthy. Uh, Prince William and Kate Middleton uh, honeymooned there in 2007, and George Clooney and his wife Amal in 2014. The picture that you're looking at here is uh, the granite rocks uh, for which the Seychelles are so well known. Um, the central granitic islands are the most beautiful, but we will be visiting all of, of some of, of the uh, different so sorts of islands. The islands in the world are either granitic, these are the only ones, volcanic or coral. Uh, and there are no volcanic islands in the Seychelles, so the other islands we'll be visiting are, um, or uh, coral. Just a little background before we go on, the country has a population of about 90,000 people and 95% of the population live in the central granitic islands where we started out. The first settlers arrived in the Seychelles in the 1770s. They were French planters and their slaves. Today, the French influence is very apparent in the islands where the language and food are heavily Creole. Creole is a language that is based on French uh, and a blend uh, with African uh, languages. Most Seychellois speak both Creole and English and that's what Seychelles people are called or Seychellois, S-E-Y-C-H-E-L-L-O-I-S. -E Industry in the islands is limited to agriculture, fruit, vegetables, cinnamon, copra, fishing and tourism. Right now, tourism isn't exactly a big deal in the Seychelles, uh, although if you're vaccinated, they'll let you in if you can get there. So off we go, folks, and uh, thanks again for joining me. So we flew from Chicago to Paris, spent about nine hours on the ground there, and then 13 more hours to get to Mahi in the Seychelles Islands. Um, it's a long way to get there, um, but uh, when you're there, uh, this is kind of where you are. The orange box shows where the islands are in regard to uh, this, the, the island of Madagascar in the south, uh, India over here. This is the Horn of Africa. And uh, this is where the ship that we went on had been uh, caught by the, uh, abducted by the Somali pirates and held for ransom. A, a year before I went on this ship, <laughs> I was surprised to learn this needless to say. The good news was that the owner paid the uh, ransom. Uh, the boat was let go and then they followed the pirates and got most of the money back. So that's the, the exciting excitement of what goes on at the Horn of Africa. Uh, here's another look. Uh, this is Mahi, uh, the, the star is Mahi, the main island. And down here is Aldabra. This of course is, is East Africa, which is about a thousand miles away, a little more than 900. So uh, we started out uh, on the island of Mahi, as I said, uh, this is the capital city. It's kind of a colonial sweet little town. Uh, we were going to be joining the group down on the beach. So we took, took a mountain rise guest house to just kind of rest up from that long flight. We managed to pick up a few uh, and it was a pretty spot. The food was wonderful. We managed to see our first Seychelles birds. This is a Madagascar turtle dove. He has a kind of a, a dove sound to him. 
And then we found a Madagascar red Fodi. This is the sparrow of the Seychelles. Imagine having that beautiful bird as a very common bird. And that's what it sounds like. Here's a, another look at this uh, red uh, Fodi. Uh, he blends in so nicely with the flowers that I did want to circle him in case some of you have trouble pulling them out. Uh, we joined the group down uh, on the beaches, the beautiful white sand beaches with the mountains behind and the water was incredible. Um, we found some uh, local birds. Um, these are Seychelles blue pigeons and this is an endemic. Now you're gonna hear the word endemic a lot uh, during this trip, uh, during this program because um, endemic means that this particular species is located only here in this one spot in the world. Obviously, there can be plants that are endemic, there can be insects that are endemic. Uh, you know, I'm primarily a birder, so the, the birds are the ones that are most interested, interesting to me. Uh, note these birds, they kind of have a red face because we're gonna see some blue pigeons next and later and they, they, they look similar, but they're completely different. This is what they sound like. And then we found the Seychelles white eye. Uh, this is an endemic bird. And uh, it, it, uh, I just noticed that it has a band on its leg. These were very nearly extinct back in 1995. And, and um, they decided, the Seychelles decided to go to work to try to save this bird. So the threats to it were uh, rats and, and, and feral cats. And they basically trapped and eliminated all of those. And uh, this was the Ministry of Environment that started this. And now there's about 400 of these birds in the islands. It's nice to see the local people caring about what they've got. Uh, we did manage to go owling. Um, obviously, if you wanna see nocturnal owls, you'd better go out at night. And we did find this endemic Seychelles scops owl. Here's what he sounds like. And he's very unusual for an owl sound. Anyway, we were glad we spotted this guy. Uh, this is our group over here, or some of them. Uh, we went to a local school because there was supposed to be the endemic Seychelles kestrel uh, hanging around the schoolyard. There was no kestrel. But it was cute to see the kids in their uniforms. These are little girls and uh, the, it's a very high incident uh, um, literacy rate in about 90% in the Seychelles. And so at last we go to the port and head, head for our boat, our ship. This is uh, Le Ponant. She's a French registry and uh, she was a 290 foot long sailing vessel uh, built in 1991. Uh, Obviously on the right is the bow, on the rear, on the left is the stern. And that's the marina where we get on and off the ship. Uh, that's where of course the Somali pirates were able to board the ship very easily without any uh, interference, unfortunately. This is how we went out of the harbor. I want to point out to you, we were on this boat for, uh, forgive me, this vessel, this ship um, for two weeks. From the time we left Port of Mahi, there was no television, no telephone service, and no radio. And, and frankly, I didn't miss it at all. This was our escort out of the Mahi port. And so off we go, uh, 16,140 square feet of sail, gliding through the water at 10 to 12 knots and 32 cabins uh, for up, up to 67 passengers. And so, Indeed, there's also a very large crew to run this boat. So there's a lot of people uh, that, that, that this boat accommodates ship. Um, this is the top deck, sun deck, and uh, where we are going, uh, because many of the islands are uninhabited, uh, we, we use the zodiacs for going ashore or on snorkeling uh, ex uh, excursions. The sails were all mechanized, it's very modern. Nobody had to run up those um, things and try to bring the sails up or anything. 
these were our French crew. They were very nice, rather handsome, but they didn't speak any English. And you can imagine that we didn't have much French either. They're the, they're the granitic mountains behind. And, and off we go. This is a little tour of the, sh of the ship. This is Antigua deck. Uh, this is where we had breakfast and lunch every day. Um, very, very fancy. Uh, and because the ship was French, they included wine with our lunches and dinners at no cost. Uh, this was the uh, area that they prepared, uh, that they displayed the food for a buffet pickup. Um, I remember one lunch, five different kinds of quiche. Wow, it was amazing. Uh, this was the, the main dining room for, for evening meals. Uh, this is not the standard fare for a birding trip. Um, the food was remarkable. Um, and did I mention the wine? Free. Now, if you were sitting in the lounge having a glass of wine, you had to pay for it, but not with your meals. And this was the lounge, the Emerald Lounge, where we did checklist every night. And this was uh, where you needed to go if you wanted a glass of wine away from the dining tables. Uh, this is the marina on the back of the, uh, the, the stern. Um, and the first stop that we made uh, after leaving Mahi was the island of Alphonse. It is a coral island. It had with a lot of palm trees and we found this beautiful blue cheeked bee eater. This is a bird that breeds in Northern Africa and Middle East and it's considered a vagrant in the Seychelles. Uh, a vagrant uh, for non-birders is a bird that's just out of its range. Uh, this bird probably got caught in the storm and got blown to the Seychelles. Uh, so because it belongs in Northern Africa. That's, that's his saw, sound, if you can hear it. We also ran across a black wing, wing Pratt and Coal also a vagrant. This was the first Pratt and Cole I'd ever seen. And uh, there were a number of male of, of frigate birds circling overhead. This particular male is um, using his gular pouch at his throat, gular pouch, uh, to inflate it. And this is supposed to turn the ladies on. Um, it's uh, it's quite a quite a scene. And that's that's the call of um, of the male frigate bird. And so we spent our first night aboard uh, Le Pona. Uh, after Alphonse, we spent a day and a half at sea. Uh, getting all the way down to the Aldabra Atoll that I pointed out to you uh, on the initial map. Um, we had, they had lectures all day long from some of the leaders who were specialists in their field, botanists and, and uh, um, other science oriented people. Uh, the Aldabra Atoll is the first of two world heritage sites um, and because the extreme isolation, uh, the many of the species are unique and, and uh, endemic. The top of the terrestrial food chain in Aldabra is the giant tortoise. Uh, the United, uh, the World Heritage Sites are established by UNESCO, United Nations Ex Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. And they named natural and cultural sites throughout the world that are of exceptional significance and universal value to all mankind. Effectively, world heritage sites are a, a worldwide version of our national parks. Uh, so moving right along, here is a look at, uh, Aldabra is really uh, uh, four islands that enclose a shallow lagoon and then it all, all of it is surrounded by a coral reef. Uh, it is an intact uh, ecosystem and therefore it's highly prized uh, as an intact ecosystem. Uh, it is made up of ancient coral reef, 250,000 years old that has been uplifted. 
This is a view that I took off of the internet uh, because I, I could never get this. It's it's 70 miles around, so it's it's a huge um, piece of island. And this was a typical day that we would have on Aldabra. Breakfast would be served from 6 to 7.30. The, there'd be a Zodiac cruise followed by a drift snorkel from 7 to 9.30. Then we'd get back on board the ship to continue on uh, to uh, another part of the atoll. And then uh, we'd have lunch. Uh, first of all, late coffee and tea and pastries on Marina Dick then 12 to 1.30 lunch, then 2.30 to 4 afternoon snorkeling, four to five afternoon tea and coffee, five to seven walks to the research station, long walk for two hours, short walk for hour and a half. 7.45 would be a recap briefing on the next day and checklist. Then dinner would be served. There was a surprise uh, entertainment on the top deck. And then after dinner, piano bar, if you could keep your eyes open, which I usually couldn't. Uh, here we were uh, boarding the, the uh, Zodiacs to head out. And, this, and here we are on the main lagoon on Aldabra. And you can see that is coral that's lifted up out of the water. Do not ask me why, how it lifted. Here's a great frigate bird as opposed to a magnificent. Here is an immature great frigate bird, obviously indicated by the white head. And here we are. This is just a shot of the water. It sounds like a dumb thing to take a picture of, but look at how clear that water is. Now, it, it, admittedly, it wasn't very deep. It was about 10 or 12 feet deep, but it was just crystal clear. Uh, you're almost on the equator in the Seychelles, but it was never unbearably hot. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, here, here the guys are out waiting in the center in the, in the lagoon. And we found a striated heron. These are pretty common around the world. Uh, here's a lesser frigate bird without, you can see the little pink throat patch that's what he can actually inflate and make that big red balloon uh, if he wants to show off to attract a lady. And this is a noisy red-footed booby. These are the same red-footed boobies that you would see if you'd been to the Galapagos Islands out in the Pacific. Um, they are typically in tropical, uh, found in tropical islands around the world. They were quite unafraid of us. We were quite close. This is not typical of birds uh, generally. Uh, it is typical of birds in the Galapagos and it's typical of birds here. As you can see, the, the birds on the right are a couple of juvenile red-footed boobies. And then we found what I thought was the prettiest bird on the trip. This is a white tern. It, it is also known as a fairy tern. I think it's so beautiful that I'd prefer to call it fairy tern because somehow white tern is kind of a blah name. But here's its call. We also found a, a black naped tern. This is an elegant looking bird. Uh, there was the lady on the nest, uh, believe it or not, uh, that sharp, sharp, sharp coral. Somehow she managed to make a nest. And uh, there is actually the egg. Um, and, and what an amazingly long beak these, these guys have. And the fact that she's sitting on the, on the coral, which is mostly gray, and she's all white, She's almost invisible, isn't that something? So now we are going ashore on another island that is part of the Aldabra Atoll. We found a little egret, 
Uh, this is a, a, a similar to our uh, snowy egrets that have yellow feet, but it's still a different species. There we go. There's the recording of its kind of squawk. And there, uh, when the sun comes out and you're out on the water, this is truly, uh, this is not me enhancing this photograph. It's just the way the water comes out. It's pretty spectacular. Ruddy tone stirs, ruddy tone turnstones were literally underfoot. And we found a coconut crab or a robber crab. These guys are humongous. Uh, they weigh up to nine pounds. And this guy was three feet uh, across from, from here over to here. So they're enormous. Um, and there are quite a few on Aldabra. Uh, this is the second largest uh, reptile after the tortoise. Here's a pied crow. Pied, you know, our crows are usually one color black. These are pied, i.e. two. <laughs> kind of different sounding from our crows. And then we ran across some uh, Seychelles flying foxes. These are extremely large fruit bats, uh, which means of course that they fly. Uh, they are a mammal and they are the only endemic mam mammal in the Seychelles. These, of course, are nocturnal, but uh, they were sure paying attention to us. You, you know, they just don't see people. It's so, it's so far away from mainland uh, Seychelles, the Granitic Islands, that most people don't get down here. Uh, this is the Aldabra Fodi, a.k.a. Comoros Fodi. It's a beautiful little bird. Sweet song. Another shot of them. Two-toned yellow and, and orange. This is uh, the Seychelles Fodi. It's not exactly as pretty as the others, but it is an endemic. And of course, as I said before, for birders, uh, endemics are what you want more than anything. And, there, and then we found this Aldabra white-throated rail. Uh, it is an endemic and it is flightless. They don't really know why there are, uh, they became flightless, but uh, they just simply don't fly. And uh, they were not afraid of us, uh, as you will see from the next few pictures. He's just walking around. I could hardly get far enough away from him to take a picture of him. Here he walked almost right up to one of, one of our group. And here's the other blue pigeons that I mentioned. These uh, have a red orbital ring, uh, as opposed to the ones that had kind of the red forehead that we saw over on Mahi. Here's their call. Oops, no, sorry, there's no call on that one. Some of these birds are just, they, they, my, the site where I get my bird calls from is Xenocanto and they just didn't have a call for that one. Um, these are the best known residents of uh, Aldabra. They are um, the, the giant tortoises. There are supposed to be about 150,000, certainly 100,000 more tortoises here than there are people in all of the uh, uh, Seychelles Islands. They can weigh up to 919 pounds. They were totally oblivious to us. Um, and, and we were equally <laughs> oblivious of them because there were a bunch of birders and a tortoise is walking right through our group. Um, uh, they are the predominant critter on the Seychelles, uh, on, on Aldabra, and they do feed on the grasses for which uh, there's just plenty so that they, they do very well. This guy just sauntered right through us. The group was looking at a uh, crab plover, which was across the water from us. It feeds on that uh, crabs, that little guy that you see in his beak and uh, it nests in burrows that it, it digs in sandy banks. Uh, this is an, also an endemic, the Aldabra drongo. I think I've got a call on this one. 
Nope, sorry, I did not. Um, I have to say that we went snorkeling almost every day. Uh, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a former scuba diver. I have gone scuba diving in Jamaica, uh, the Bahamas, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, uh, Belize. Um, I can say without reservation that the fish were absolutely unbelievable uh, in, the, in the Seychelles. Uh, this is Linda and Peter Bure, whom I met on a birding trip in, the, in Sri Lanka many years ago. They, um, they've been all over the world uh, snorkeling and they said they'd never seen anything like it. Uh, I do not do underwater photography. Many years ago, I tried and it, it's, it's too much. So these are pictures I took, but they are a, a fish that we saw, lionfish. There's a couple of these lionfish, beautiful angelfish. This is a hawksbill turtle endangered. Uh, we, um, the, the, one of the highlights of the snorkels was the drift snor snorkel between Picard and Grand Terre Islands. We floated with the outgoing current and gazed down on all kinds of fish as well as over 20 sea turtles. Um, so uh, the, the naturalist that was along who was the fish specialist tallied 125 different species of fish for the trip. So uh, we are now going ashore on the uninhabited uh, atoll of Cosmolito, uh, some distance away, but it's known for its seabirds, nesting terns, boobies, and frigate birds. Um, you know, you, when you come ashore, you have to wade ashore. So you have to take your shoes off unless you wanna walk around with wet shoes. Uh, this is my travel uh, partner, Gloria Hoffman, getting her shoes back on. But we found this cute little hermit crab while we were sitting on the sand. Hermit crabs uh, uh, find a shell and crawl into it. And then when they get bigger, if they get bigger, they just have to go find a bigger shell. This guy looked pretty comfortable in his present shell. So here we were, the nesting boobies were unafraid of us. Here's a red-footed booby on the nest. And look at that face. I mean, do you think that that's where women got the idea to use, use eye makeup? So beautiful, that light blue and pink coloration. And here's mom. And I, I wouldn't say that they aren't afraid of us. This was mom clearly protecting her baby, but they weren't disturbed enough to fly away from us or anything. And here he was, this little red-footed booby baby. Try to say that 10 times in a row. Here he was again. It's gonna be a long time before he can fly. We found the brown boobies uh, that breed only on Cosmolito Atoll. And once again, the water, the sky, the clouds, simply idyllic. Here's, here were three of our leaders. This was a Victor Emanuel nature tour. This is Victor over on the right. Um, these are all outstanding birders and, and really fine people. Here's a young brown booby starting to try to use those wings and a gray heron posing for me. Birds don't usually do that for you. Here's another uh, great frigate, frigate bird with an inflated guler pouch. You can't take that down uh, like puncturing a, a balloon. It, it kind of has to go down pretty much on its own. Here's the female of the great frigate bird with just the, the white chest. And here are the mass boobies. These are a split, meaning it's a different species from the Galapagos Nazca booby. Okay, so. I don't have any Nazca booby pictures because I don't have any Galapagos pictures here. But they decided this was a separate species and that's their call. And it was clearly, uh, this was March. It was clearly mating season because they, they started doing this um, uh, beak tapping. 
and uh, displays. It was really charming. The cloud formations were breathtaking and they were different every day. We found another little egret. And here the great gray herons are out fishing. This would be the equivalent of what we know as our great blue heron, but it's a different species. And uh, that's where they find all their best food is in shallow waters. And here was a pretty flower with a a bug. There was our beautiful ship offshore. And uh, here's some of the clouds I was talking about. They, they just, they were just amazing. And they would, didn't necessarily mean the weather was going to be bad. Although we did get occasional rain, nothing enough to impair our activities and a nice little rainbow just to prove what I said about rain. And finally, finally, we found the Seychelles kestrel that we'd missed in the schoolyard uh, back on Mahi. So we were delighted to catch this, this bird. And we found a local spider. He was about six inches in diameter. And we found some brown noddies. These were, I'd never seen these before. Very pretty birds. And here's a whole bunch of brown noddies. So we arrived at Cousin Island. Now that's the French pronunciation. That's, we'd say cousin, but because of the French influence, it's Cousin. Uh, this is a, an important bird sanctuary for nesting seabirds. Um, you have to have a rat-free island for ground nesting birds, obviously, because the rats are, uh, would be devastated to ground nests. nests. Uh, when we went ashore, we had to get into our zodiacs and then stay out in the water and switch over to the, the boats that would take us to shore. We were not allowed to bring our own uh, zodiacs um, ashore there because they were afraid that our, our boats might have picked something up that would get on the island and be a disaster environmentally for them. It was, it's not fun in a bouncing zodiac, I'll tell you. But what a treat, look at this, a beautiful white-tailed tropic bird on the nest. And I, I'm standing right next to this bird. This doesn't happen, usually. And here we find, I found two fairy terns or white terns together, which was a tree. And, and that, that is really blue up at the base of the beak and then that black eye. And they had a baby, they had a baby. Now, let me tell you about white terns or fairy terns. They don't make a nest. They just lay an egg on a horizontal branch and sit on the egg. And then the baby hatches and sits there till it can fly. And they were just, the baby was just cute as could be. But you can't imagine that happening. Anyway, this was really, I think, my favorite bird of the, of the trip. So now we've gotten back to the granitic islands, because uh, all of the ones around Aldabra for the south were coral. These are the granitic islands, and we are going to Pralin, which is this island up here. Uh, but these are the largest. Uh, this is the Mahi where we originally flew into, uh, and then we went south. And we're going to go to Pralin right now. It's a very interesting thing. This is the second the largest of them, and this this is these beaches and the water. This is Anse Lazio. And the main reason you go to Pralin is for the Valley de May. And this is an endemic cocoa de mer palms. It's also the second world heritage site in the Seychelles. It is a giant of the plant world. These trees, the male trees reach 98 feet tall. That's as tall as a 10 story building folks, 10 story. It takes 20 to 40 years to reach maturity and start to bear fruit. 
um, the, the females only get 78 feet tall, but the females are the ones that bear the coconut fruit. And, uh, and you can only go into the Valley de May with, with guides. And these are the coconuts. These are the, this is a female. And this is the female coconut without the outer shell. They're extremely heavy. Uh, the, the largest one, I, I, I couldn't even begin to lift that larger one. I think it was about 65 pounds. The fruit, fruit takes seven years to mature. And of course, it's obviously the largest seed in the world. Um, the the uh, coconuts are very prized. Um, we were not interested in buying uh, one, but they are they are sold uh, to, to to tourists. Um, I understand that a tourist paid three hundred dollars, and, and you have to buy it from a licensed seller, and you have to have a, a document that says that you bought it as a legal uh, purchase. Otherwise, you would not be allowed to take it out of the country, nor would you, you might even go to jail. Uh, it, every coconut is precious from these trees. Uh, the trees are enormous. Uh, there's no way to photograph them, not for me. This is the male flower on a male tree. It was seven feet long. This, this was just an astounding experience. Uh, the, the, oops, sorry. The coconut, the, the weight of the coconuts on the female tree, it's probably why they only get to be 78 feet tall. They're so busy carrying all those heavy coconuts. Anyway, uh, here's a little gecko on the male flower up here. And here's a bronze gecko on the male flower. And here's another, this is, this is a gecko here. And in front of the gecko is a white slug. Oh, I should go back to the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the palms are like, the, the palm fronds are like 20 feet wide. It, it's just amazing. Um, out, just outside the Valley de May, we found the Seychelles black parrot, an endemic. And it really is, I mean, I'm, I'm partial to colorful parrots, but this was an unusually pretty bird. So the gorgeous granitic island of La Digue is where we went that afternoon. This is the place where you see most of the pictures of, of the Seychelles uh, This with these remarkable granite rocks, which uh, it is believed were part of a mountaintop uh, back when there was a, a massive uh, continent called Godwalla Land uh, that broke up and became Australia and Antarctica and South America and Africa. It's it's hard to conceive of. I just don't, I don't do geology, but these rocks were really stunning. And all oh, these two little boys in their boat with that wonderful water, I thought were so cute. So when we're going around La Digue, uh, this was the vehicle we went on. And uh, some of the other locals went around uh, on a vehicle pulled by a bullock. Uh, we did spot the male Seychelles paradise flycatcher on La Digue. Uh, he's a handsome fellow, and that is really about a three or four foot long tail and a beautiful eye. This is his girlfriend, uh, the female, not nearly so flashy, but probably does most of the uh, sitting on the eggs. And this is the Seychelles sunbird. Uh, this is the old, world, old world's version of our hummingbirds. They do not have any hummingbirds. Uh, they do have sunbirds. And this is the Seychelles uh, sunbird and it is an endemic. Here's a little recording. That's kind of a typical uh, sunbird sound. More shots of the beautiful rocks and coral and water. I, I, I almost, pulled, almost uh, took these people out but I thought if you don't leave the people in the picture, you don't know how big those rocks are. Just amazingly beautiful. This is my travel companion again, Gloria, and the two of us, that was me a few years ago. So on the last day on board Le Ponant, we visited forested Ar Aride Island. It's supposed to be, uh, it's known for its beautiful lesser nadis and white-tailed tropic birds. 
Uh, here are the lesser nadis. And that's their sound. There's a white-tailed tropic bird. That was the bird that you saw sitting on the ground nesting on the rat-free island. And here's a red-tailed tropic bird. And here is the Seychelles magpie robin. It is an endemic and it is a great success story. Uh, it was on the brink of extinction and BirdLife International got into efforts to save the bird. They split up the population so that if one population went uh, bad, the others would not uh, be. And so as a result, uh, this total population is now something in the neighborhood of 250 birds. And um, it's really nice because they brought the Seychelles Wa, the Seychelles people in to helping the birds survive. Um, you can see each, each bird is very prized. There, there are bands that they know exactly where the bird was hatched and, and so on and so forth. And then we saw a common gallinule. It also had a, had a, a, a band. We do, do have common gallinules around here. Oh, I'm sorry, this was a bronze-eyed bronze gecko. I, I, when we saw the other one on the, on the Valley de May cocoa palms, uh, you couldn't see the eye. So um, the, once again, a pair of fairy turns to say goodbye. And then back on board Le Pona, we said farewell to the members of the crew who had done so much for us. Uh, this is Francis, the chef. Uh, and boy, you, you can tell people are cheering for Francis. He, we really ate like kings. This was one of our favorite waiters. Look at that grin. Uh, these were our cabin attendants. They were all wonderful. And these are the Zodiac drivers. Who knew there was such an occupation as being a Zodiac driver? The captain is sabering a bottle of champagne. I'd never heard of this. It, it did work. He did manage to open the champagne, but it did seem like a pretty good waste. So Peter and Barry are toasting the end of a successful trip and the sun is setting as we say farewell. During the trip, we visited 12 of the main islands. We saw three species of giant tortoises, 12 endemic bird species, rare land birds and myriad seabirds. We enjoyed all of the animals' tameness. It's unusual except in the Galapagos Islands. We also had distant whale sightings and frequent spinner dolphin sightings, but of course I could not photograph those. So farewell, we say, on this cold winter day to the enchanting, warm, sunny, and beautiful Seychelles Island and their beautiful birds, beaches, mountains, and fish. Thanks for watching, folks. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Wow, what a beautiful place, Mary Lou. Thank you for sharing your trip with us. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm going to look in the chat and see what questions people have for you. Um, what year and month did you go? Oh, this was uh, 2009. Uh, and, and we went in March. Um, Le Pona. Uh, spends the winters in the Indian Ocean. And so you, it, Seychelles is gonna be the same year round because it's on the equator. It doesn't dr dramatically change. But Le Pona can, can ply the Mediterranean in the spring and the summer. Uh, so that's why, that's why we were there in March. Also, it's the best time to be gone from here, needless to say. So what was your average temperature like there? Oh, you know, we were in and out of the water so much. I, you know, I, I don't ever recall even being hot, but I do remember taking three showers before lunch one day because I'd been in, the, in and out of the water so much. Uh, oh, I'd say 80, 85 uh, and, and not, not particularly humid. Someone is asking, is the long back end of the tropic bird only for show or does it serve a special purpose? I think it's just special show. I, 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 I'm really not an ornithologist, so I can't make a, I can't make a judgment call on that. 
If anybody else knows, just put it in chat or unmute yourself. Sure. There's right. some uh, comments. Fantastic. Wow, that was amazing. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Oh, how nice. Always good to hear good things. Um, fantastic, Mary Lou. Reminds me of the Galapagos, but a different flavor. Must go there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is the similarity of the islands being so protected and so pristine is similar. It's just that more people get to the Galapagos than get to Seychelles. Um, I, I, in fact, I don't even know who gets to the Seychelles anymore these days. But, but uh, the, the, the animals being uh, not afraid of you uh, is, is, is similar in, in the Seychelles as it was in Galapagos. I remember getting off a bouncy boat in the Galapagos and stumbling up and reaching out to, to touch a rock to steady myself and it was a sea lion. <laughs> it just, oh dear. And then I stumbled a few more feet and it was the same thing. Um, so those are unique experiences, true, true nature experiences. Galapagos is wonderful. There's a question, are those non-native birds, do they do okay on the islands? Uh, yeah, probably not. Um, you know, when they get blown off their, um, uh, they, they might get, you know, sometimes in, in a storm, their GPS system gets goofed up. Uh, it happens around here. I mean, we had some black-bellied whistling ducks over in Well Met uh, a few year, a year or so ago. Um, if the bird gets itself sorted out, it can easily fly the, th the Thousand Islands back to mainland Africa. Uh, that's, that's really not the problem. But sometimes, it, it, you know, if, if, they can't, if they don't have a buddy, they can't breed. So, you know, you, you, you have to hope they, they find their way back. And, and chances are they do. A thousand miles isn't, isn't that big a deal for a, a bird. Someone wants to know if you slept on the boat or on in any hotels. Uh, oh, we were on the boat for two weeks uh, in in cabins. I shared a cabin with Gloria. Just FYI, um, you know, a cabin on a cruise ship is it, it you pay for it if you're only one person or if you're two people. So it behooves you to have a second person there. They uh, the little guest house up in the mountains when we first got to Mahi. Uh, was the one place we stayed in. and then the, the tour group, the Victor Emanuel Nature Tour, did have us in a, a lodge right down on the water right before we sailed uh, for a night because everybody was coming from, from such a long distance that uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't get off the ship, get off the plane and go straight to the ship and start sailing. As it happened, my, <laughs> my travel partner's suitcase didn't make the the nine hour <laughs> layover in Paris. And we were lucky we'd gone in a couple of days in advance or she would have spent two weeks with no clothes. So. All right, there's someone commenting that you're a very brave lady and thank you for sharing your trip with us. <laughs> um, someone is saying, it's my dream to go there. My travel book has listed it as the most beautiful place in the world. I think they now have more fancy hotels. I don't know if that's such a good thing, but. Um. Well, Mahi may uh, have, but you know, these, these islands are really remote. Uh, there, there, are some, there are some very fancy. I mean, the, the place that the tour group stayed was I think $400 a night. That's, that's why when we were on our own, when we got in a day early, we stayed at the Mahi guest house. I'm not spending $400 a night, but yeah, th there are places to stay and um, and, and, and I'm sure that there are ferries between the islands uh, if you wanted to go to Seychelles on your own. Uh, I, you know, that just doesn't happen to be how my trip was run. Uh, so uh, yeah, you could go there. In fact, some years ago, uh, there were, you could not go between uh, Kenya and Tanzania directly. And in order for tourists, and, and the reason Kenya is wonderful, but the reason people wanted to go to Tanzania was to go to the Ngoro and Goro crater. So, so what they had to do was they'd fly into Kenya, do their touring in Kenya, and then fly to the Seychelles and then fly to Tanzania and then go do Ngoro and Goro crater. So th that's how some people got introduced to how wonderful the Seychelles were. 
Fortunately, Africa has cleaned up its act and you can go between countries without any trouble now, so. Here's a couple more questions. What predators do these birds have and where are you going on your next trip? <laughs> well, um, the, 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 main, the main predators are introduced uh, beasts like rats and cats. Um, these islands where there has been no human intervention bringing those things ashore, these birds are really, really fine. Um, yeah, it, it's cats and rats for, for the most part. Uh, and, uh, and so that's why, uh, that's why the, the, the rat-free islands are so, so specific about how you can come ashore them. And uh, as for my next trip, I'm, I'm, I'm in the balance between tropical birding in Borneo and going to Spain. So um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just waiting to find which one's gonna fill up so that I go on it. I'm very fond of trap, tropical birding and Borneo would really be uh, the trip of a lifetime for me. So well, while we're talking about that, I'll plug the program we just booked on April 29th. We've invited uh, Gina Nichols from Sunrise Birding to present her trip um, to Borneo. So uh, save the date for Thursday, April 29th. It's going to be at night at seven o'clock and you'll be able to um, go to that program on Borneo. And I have to say, I have to tell you that first of all, Gina is a, a, a fabulous birder. Um, she's also a remarkably good photographer and a very good speaker. So um, definitely put that one on your calendar. Uh, and also uh, Sunrise Birding is my very favorite bird touring company. That's who I go with 100% of the time nowadays. Someone also wants to know if you have any information on how the islands have changed since you were there. Not really, not really. There's, there's, not, a, not, there's not a whole lot of news about Seychelles. Um, I doubt if it's changed very much. I, I, I did look up to see what was going on in terms of COVID. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I get for a while there, they weren't allowing anybody to come in. Um, but you see, these islands are pretty much of self-sustaining. They, you know, they, they do their own farming of their own food. And as long as you don't like to eat meat, um, my guess is the islands pretty much stay the same. All right, that is the last question. Thank well, you, Mary Lou, for a wonderful presentation. I wanna remind everybody that Mary Lou will be back with us Monday, March 29th, and she's taking us to the British Isles. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Terry. Hello, Mary Lou from Florida.